In this session, we want to consider, as you can see by the title, uh, preaching the epistles in a genre sensitive way. Um, so this week, we will have the privilege of spending time in uh, First Peter, uh, which is an epistle. And so we want to, uh, before we get into the actual text and go further into the uh, specifics of First Peter, just to, to remind ourselves of some of the characteristics of the genre of the epistles, and also to remind ourselves of the value of preaching in a genre sensitive way. Um, so we will be doing those two aspects together, just a, a gentle reminder uh, as to what we mean by uh, genre sensitive preaching. And then we will look in, we'll be look, looking in, uh, in yeah, look at uh, zooming in to some of the characteristics of the epistles and see how to replicate some of the rhetorical characteristics of the epistles in our preaching. Um, begin with a very general definition of expository preaching. Um, typically in a classroom, I'll get the students to define expository preaching and uh, I've noticed over the years that even preachers who preach in an expository fashion for many years, they struggle to give a good definition. Uh, so let me just give, a, give us a simple definition of expository preaching. We could prob probably do better than this. We could go into further detail, but I think it's helpful for, for us just to be reminded of what we uh, hope to achieve as expository preachers. Expository preaching expresses the commitment to faithfully communicate the content of a passage of scripture to the modern audience. Uh, so uh, more than a methodology, it's a commitment. It's a commitment to faithfully presenting, communicating, conveying the content of a passage of scripture to the modern audience. And I hope that you share this basic definition of expository preaching. Now, when we seek to teach the Bible or preach the Bible in an expository fashion, um, we know that this is not easy. It takes hours of prayer saturated study. It takes careful exegetical work, uh, but we believe that it's worth it because we believe that our calling as preachers and teachers is to communicate God's word to God's people. And so we're willing to work hard. We're willing to dedicate and invest hours of our week studying a specific passage of scripture to then be faithful conduits who are able to communicate, to convey the passage of scripture to God's uh, people. And uh, one of the reasons why we seek to preach and teach the Bible in this way is because there's no real alternative to this. <laughs> the alternative to this would be to um, teach our own ideas, clothe them with the authority of scripture, and feed our people our own ideas. So really we have a choice. Do we want to convey God's word, God's ideas to God's people? Or do we want to convey our own ideas, our own thinking, clothing them with divine authority and feeding them to our people? And it should be immediate obvious uh, to us that that is no alternative because that is detrimental and deadly for our people. So we can only really call ourselves expository preachers if the content of our sermon exposits and expounds the content of the preaching text. Um, if we're not doing that, then we have no right to define ourselves, to call ourselves uh, expository preachers. Now, while I embrace, I embrace this understanding of expository preaching, I would like to try to enhance this understanding for us. And I would like us to consider that expository preaching should include not only faithfulness to the content of the passage, but also a sensibility to the form of the passage. So our ex expository preachers, we should seek to be faithful not only to the content of the passage, what the author said, but we also want to be faithful, sensitive 
to the form of the passage, how he said it. And so the content of a sermon should explain and apply the biblical text and the shape of the sermon should seek to replicate the impact, the rhetorical impact of the biblical text. Uh, the consequence of this is that our approach when we preach uh, a psalm should be significantly different from when we preach an epistle. When we preach narrative should be different from when we preach apocalyptic literature. The kind of literature that we're preaching should determine, at least in part, the shape of our sermon, because we want to be sensible and sensitive and faithful to the content and to the form of the biblical text. And so as preachers, we want to say what the text says, and we want to do what the text does. In other words, we want to see how we can replicate the rhetorical impact of the biblical text. Now, why is this so important? Let me give you four reasons. The first reason is that content and form cannot be separated. In communication, in any kind of communication, content and form cannot be separated. What you say is heavily impacted by how you say it. The same truth can be uh, presented in different forms and it will impact in different ways. So let me give you a simple example. The Lord is sovereign over every nation and over every detail of your life. Okay, this is a biblical truth that we find throughout scripture. The Lord is sovereign over all nations and he's sovereign over every detail of your life. We find this truth explained in the epistles. Paul, uh, on several occasions and several passages, explains logically with direct propositions that the Lord is sovereign over every nation and over every detail of our life. The same truth is also uh, presented elsewhere in scripture. For example, you could argue that this is the main message of the book of Esther. Uh, the book of Esther is written in a narrative form it doesn't even use the word God, uh, which is the peculiarity of the book of Esther. And yet that book is convincingly showing us that the Lord is sovereign over all nations. He's sovereign in Jerusalem. He's sovereign, he's sovereign in Persia. He's sovereign over all nations. And he's also sovereign over every detail of the life of Esther. This time, this truth is presented in narrative form. And so the same truth is reaching us in a different way. Uh, perhaps just to interact a little, what's, what's the difference between how we receive a logical propositional statement compared to how we receive a truth which is conveyed to us in narrative form? The advantage of logical propositional statements is that it helps you to crystallize the concept. You can grasp it cognitively, you understand it clearly, and you can start to think about all the implications. And so it reaches your cognitive <laughs> aspect and you, you grasp it and you understand it and then you unpack it. But when you read the story of Esther, it through the narrative, it shows you what it means that God is sovereign and you feel it you identify with the various characters in the story uh, you uh, follow the drama of the plot and the emotions that you feel as you work, work your way through the plot is helping this truth 
uh, lodge itself into your heart. So perhaps you don't understand it cognitively in the same way, but you feel a greater identification with this truth and you grasp it in a different, in a different way. Then we have the book of Proverbs. And we have this famous verse from the book of Proverbs, this famous proverb. The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Again, it's a very similar truth. The Lord is sovereign over every uh, detail. And yet it's conveyed to us in a very succinct way, which is typical of uh, Proverbs. So it becomes memorable. It lodges itself into your minds and it becomes a portable reminder of God's sovereignty. So I think we can, by these examples, we can start to see the link that exists between content and form. The same truth communicated, conveyed in different forms reaches us and impacts us in a different way. And so as preachers, we need to pay attention to the form as well as the content of a passage. We should not be preaching epistles in the same way that we preach narrative, in the same way that we preach a psalm. But we've understood this when it comes to interpretation. We know that we interpret the various literatures and scripture in different ways, but we have perhaps yet to fully understand what it means when we preach we must learn to preach in such a way as to replicate some of the rhetorical effects that are specific to a particular genre of scripture. The second reason why this is important is because it derives from a high view of scripture. The Lord didn't just give us a systematic theology and I'm grateful that it's not a systematic theology. Uh, the Lord has given us variety. He has conveyed his inspired word through propositions, through law, through poetry, through proverbs, through narrative. And whether a specific truth is conveyed in one of these forms is not incidental. We believe that the Lord has inspired his word, not just the content of his word, but also the form of his word. And we need to recognize the variety that we find in scripture, and we need to pay attention to that as preachers. So God is and was committed to variety, and therefore as preachers and teachers of God's word, we need to be committed to the same variety. The third reason why we must pay attention to the form and become genre sensitive preaching uh, preachers is because if we've preached for any length of time, hopefully we have realized that there is no such thing as a one size fits all sermon form. I know we are uh, usually taught in seminary uh, a very basic uh, homiletic form, preaching form, preaching shape, introduction, three points, starting with a P and, and then a conclusion and perhaps a hymn in there somewhere. Uh, okay, that works sometimes, uh, but it doesn't work every time. And uh, we cannot flatten the beauty and the variety of scripture into this basic form and produce uh, cookie cutter <laughs> sermons. There is variety in scripture and we need to replicate this variety in our preaching as well. And the fourth reason why it's important to become a genre sensitive preacher is because not only we will benefit from variety, but our listeners will also benefit from variety. I didn't start with this because I think uh, scripture itself is calling us to preach with variety. But I think we also need to pay attention to the needs of our listeners and uh, not cause them to hear the same sermon over and over and over again, or the same sermon form over and over and over again. Um, as Spurgeon said, we need to make sure that our listeners are awake 
because if they are not awake, we can have the best content in the world, but it has no impact. And so if we learn to preach with variety, to replicate the variety that we find in scripture, then that will help us engage our listeners. Also recognizing that our listeners have different learning styles and so, so some of them will benefit more from narratives compared to epistles. And uh, if we are replicating that variety in our preaching, that will be of great benefit to your listeners as well. Um, Haddon Robinson goes a step further. And he uh, noticed how more people have turned away from the Christian faith out of boredom rather than out of logic. Boring sermons not only cause yawning and heavy eyes, but destroy life and hope. Well, that's probably discouraging for most of us who have preached this morning. Um, but I think it helps us to, to realize that it's important that we make sure that we do not flatten the beauty of God's word but we seek to convey this beauty in our preaching. I'm not saying that we should aim to entertain. Uh, if we go down the route of entertainment, the world will always be better at entertainment than what we <laughs> will be. But I'm suggesting that we need to rediscover the beauty of God's word and consider ways in which we can convey this beauty in our preaching. And so I'm not decreasing our understanding of expository preaching. I'm enhancing understanding of expository preaching, not just content. That's a good start. That's a great start. But let's learn to pay attention as well to the form. What this means in practice is that we need to learn to read literature and we need to learn to read the different types of literature that we have in scripture. Uh, Martin Luther grasped this a few centuries ago. He said, I'm persuaded that without knowledge of literature, pure theology cannot at all endure. Certainly it is my desire that there shall be as many poets and rhetoricians as possible because I see that by these studies, as by no other means, people are wonderfully fitted for grasping the sacred truth and for handling it skillfully and happily. So we need to learn how to read the different types of literature that we find in scripture and also learn to enjoy the different types of literature that we have in scripture. And if we do that, we will become skillful in handling this variety in our preaching. When we look at the epistles, uh, because it's a familiar terrain uh, for many uh, of us, uh, 21 out of the 27 books in the New Testament, in the New Testament are epistles, uh, the exceptions, of course, the Gospels, the Book of Acts, and Revelation, although even the book of Revelation has some elements of being uh, like an epistle. Um, the other advantage that we have is that we learn to preach in the epistles. And so usually we <laughs> struggle to preach poetry or we struggle to preach narratives, uh, but we feel at home preaching the epistles because we learn to preach in the epistles typically. And also because we tend, I think, to spend most of our preaching Sundays in the epistles. I think it's our default uh, um, place in the Bible for, for preaching. And the third advantage is that there are many elements in common between epistles and sermons. Okay, so uh, if we think about the sermon form, and uh, the typical sermon form, and we think of the epistles, we can see that there are many elements in, uh, in common. Uh, perhaps someone would like to highlight some of these elements. What, what are the key common elements between sermons and epistles? What do they have in common? Now, to understand a little bit more of the genre of the epistles, it's use, useful to compare them to uh, letters. 
in the first century when Paul was writing, we had quite a distinct form. We had a letter and we had an epistle. And uh, letters were informal, while epistles were formal. Uh, letters were written quickly, while epistles were written with care. Letters tended to be personal, while epistles tended to be public, and so written for a wide audience. Letters were short, um, typically one, one sheet of papyrus, while epistles were uh, long. Um, so if you look at those descriptions, um, where would you classify the majority of the letters or the epistles <laughs> that we have in the New Testament? Uh, would you describe it more as like letters, informal, written quickly, personal, short, or would you place them more um, towards the epistle side of the spectrum? I think that would be right. I think most of them would be closer to uh, what's described here as an epistle. You would have some letters uh, which are brief, short, extremely personal, uh, but most of them considering the length, uh, considering the care with which they were written, most of them would be closer to an epistle. I think the distinguishing factor of the Pauline epistles or of the epistles in the New Testament is that even when they are long, they never lose their personal touch. You always see Paul's pastoral heart uh, that is displayed through the, the epistles. So even though they have that kind of more formal, longer dimension, they still have the personal warmth of uh, the apostles. Uh, the primary characteristic of the um, epistles is that they can be described as occasional theology and what we mean by that is that Paul or the other uh, epistle writers they they are addressing specific people who live in a specific location who uh, are facing specific challenges so it's occasional Paul is writing into specific circumstances and yet he is addressing those circumstances with a deep theological reflection. And so we combine these two elements together and we define the epistles as occasional theology. And so when we are reading an epistle, we need to acknowledge that we are listening to one side of a telephone conversation. I find this um, way of defining the epistles extremely helpful. Uh, so we are listening to Paul, and Paul is speaking to the church in Corinth, and sometimes Paul is responding to some situations or uh, some comments of the church in Corinth, and yet we are unable to hear what the church in Corinth is saying to the Apostle Paul, but yet we can hear what Paul is saying in response. And so from that, we're able to guess or to try to uh, paint a picture and understand the, the context in the church of uh, Corinth. And so we need to be aware that we are part of a conversation. There was a conversation between Paul and the churches that he was writing to, and yet we only get to hear one side of the conversation. Uh, Fee and Stuart, in their famous book, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth, they call the epistles task theology. Um, what they mean by that is that this is not a systematic theology. Uh, none of the epistles or a systematic theology of the Apostle Paul, where he's simply writing about theology, about God, he's always writing theology to address specific needs of specific people. And it's the specific circumstances that direct the specific theological focus of an epistle. So, for example, in Romans and in Galatians, Paul speaks much about justification because he is addressing a specific need. And yet he hardly touches upon it in some of the other epistles because he's addressing different needs. So the specific theological focus is determined by the specific 
context. It's task theo theology. Paul is a practical theologian more than a systematician. So because they're occasional theology, we need to grasp the occasional nature and the theological nature of uh, the epistles. When we think about grasping the occasional nature, the crucial aspect here is to consider the historical context. The better we understand the historical context of the recipients of the letter, the better we are positioned to interpret and understand these epistles. And so we need to do some hard work. We need to dig into the historical context, sim similar to what you did in the first session. We need to understand the needs and that will help us interpret then the message of the epistles. Um, we also need to be careful about historical research. Um, why, why do you think we need to be careful about historical research? What, what's the limits of historical research or what's the dangers? What are the dangers? Uh, yeah, and the, the other factor as well to consider is that culture is extremely complex. And usually we think that simply by investing an hour or two in, in trying to study the historical context, suddenly we've become an expert as to what all the Jews in the first century believed. <laughs> it's very difficult for me to describe what Italians believe. And I live here in, in, in Italy and I was brought up here in Italy. Never mind trying to uh, summarize in a few brief sentences what a distant culture for me believed. So, so we need to be careful about historical research. I think the key here is to have the biblical text itself as the driving factor of our interpretation rather than our his, the historical reconstruction of what was taking place at the time. We allow that to shed light on the biblical text, but it's a biblical text that is a driving factor in our interpretation. Yeah. Having said that, there are many benefits of studying the historical research. For example, one of the difficulties that we often have as preachers is understanding how to apply a specific biblical truth. Uh, we tend to be, we tend to do okay with explanation, but when it comes to application, we always struggle, or at least I struggle with application. The benefit of historical research is that it helps us to see how the truth of scripture was meant to be applied in the first century. And that can give us a, a clue as to how we should apply the same biblical truth into our context. So in a sense, scripture comes to us pre-applied. And so all we need to do is replicate that application many centuries later, taking account of the differences. When it comes to the theological nature um, of uh, the epistles, uh, it's good to remember that they were designed for wide circulation. So even though the epistle writers were addressing specific issues, they were aware and they even encouraged <laughs> circulation of their letters. And so um, what they are conveying is not limited to a specific circumstance, but is applicable to different uh, circumstances. They speak about ultimate truths. <laughs> they speak about sin, about salvation, about sanctification, about society, about sovereignty, about, uh, about service. And so uh, they are designed for wide circulation. And typically the epistles give specific instructions, but they build these specific instructions on ultimate truth. So you will have uh, Paul addressing the church in Corinth um, speaking about issues of adultery or fornication or sexual immorality and he addresses the specific situation building on the ultimate truth that our bodies are part of God's redemptive plan uh, or he will uh, address issues of marriage uh, presenting us the paradigm of Christ and the church um, or he will discuss the importance of being generous, of giving, by helping us to uh, consider 
all that Christ gave up for us. Um, and so the specifics of the epistles are always built upon the stronger ultimate uh, theological truths of the epistles. One final aspect to keep in mind when we're preaching the, uh, the epistles is this dynamic of presence in absence. Uh, the goal of the epistles was to sub substitute a personal visit of the Apostle Paul or another apostle. And so they were writing because they wanted to impact the church in the first century without being able to go there. Despite that, you will see and feel the ethos of the biblical writer come across. Uh, Paul speaks with authority. Peter speaks with authority. Peter invites the elders to shepherd God's flock, and he does that as a fellow elder. And so um, Peter is aware and he is maximizing his ethos, who he is, to persuade his listeners to grasp and to um, obey the word that he has given. And so often we find in the epistles that uh, the author writes using the first or second person pronoun. He is exhorting them. He is being direct because he is substituting his presence. And yet it is a mitigated directness. Um, it's very different rebuking someone in person compared to writing a letter. When you write a letter, uh, especially in the first century or an epistle, uh, you know that this letter will be read two or three months down the line. <laughs> and so uh, you can be sharp, but you're aware that that sharpness will be mitigated by the distance, both the geographical distance, but also the time difference from when Paul penned the words compared to when the listeners, the recipients received these uh, words. And so when we preach the epistles, we want to consider how to maximize the ethos of the author as we uh, preach this part of God's word. Let me give you um, seven very simple, very basic <laughs> instructions or some tips for preaching the epistles uh, before we'll break in the, in the groups. Uh, the first one, we've already mentioned it a number of times, um, grasp the narrative background of the epistles. Do the hard work of historical research. Uh, we've spoken about the limits of historical research, but th these should not discourage us <laughs> from working hard. If anything, they should help us to see the importance of investing hours and hours trying to understand the specific context in which these letters were written. Second advice is to make sure or enc I encourage you to preach the epistles systematically. Because they are arguments built on ultimate truth, uh, we will maximize the value of these epistles if we systematically work our way through the epistle. Uh, we will understand that it's one coherent argument and we will feel the power of the, that argument. Uh, this morning in church, we just finished the epistle of Hebrews. Uh, we were inspired by Peter last year, uh, preaching Hebrews at, at the LF. And it was remarkable just to see the value from September until May of just working our, through, our way through this epistle and grasping the full depth, or at least in part, the depth of this epistle. So um, the best way to preach the epistles is not just to zoom in, take a passage out, but uh, to work your way through the whole argument. The third tip, which is important, is to make sure you anchor the imperatives in the indicatives. And what I mean by that is that we need to remember 
that when God is calling us to do something, that is always in response to something that he has done or is doing or will do. Uh, we, he calls us to obey because we are his people. He has made us his people. He has bought us with the precious blood of the lamb. And because of that, we are to live a life worthy of the gospel. So we need to make sure we're always anchoring the imperatives of the epistles in the indicatives. What God has done for us is the driving factor that uh, enables us to respond in obedience to him. If we do not connect the imperatives with the indicatives, then the risk is that we will end up preaching moralistic sermons. Do this or do that or don't do this or don't do that. And we're calling our people to live a holy life without giving them the power, the engine of the gospel in their life. And so it's crucial to do that. And the way in which we do that is different depending on the epistle. And so some epistles have a clear structure. For example, Ephesians chapters 1 to 3 uh, presents uh, the gospel in many different ways. And then from 4 to 6 calls us to live out the gospel in our life. And so when we're preaching 4 to 6, we will want to remind our people continuously that the reason why we're called to live this way is because of what God has done for us in Christ the same is true of Romans. And then there's other epistles where it's a bit more, in, uh, how do you say in, in English? Um, inters, interspersed, okay? Where you have gospel leading to application. In, in, in Corinthians, it seems to take that form. He reminds us of the gospel and he applies it to a specific context. So we want to make sure that we are anchoring the imperatives in the indicatives. Fourth tip is to explore, enjoy, and exploit the subforms. Uh, another element that the epistles have in common with sermons is that they rely on external material and they incorporate external material. And so we will find hymns in the epistles, we will find proverbs. We will find rhetorical questions. We will find uh, metaphors. And uh, we want to make sure that we are maximizing the rhetorical effect of these elements that are included in the epistles. Uh, we want to make sure that we're maximizing the metaphor of a farmer or an athlete or a soldier or a seal, or we're maximizing the value of rhetorical questions. So we pay attention to these subforms and we seek to maximize them in our preaching. Number five, get in tune with the tone of the passage. We need to remember that the gospel writers uh, write with different tones. Sometimes they're rebuking. And if they are rebuking, it's appropriate that our sermon matches that tone. Uh, but other times we find an explosion of worship, a doxology, where the apostle is simply exploding in his worship to God. We don't want to turn that explosion of worship into a rebuke. Or if uh, Peter is telling us that we are to experience inexpressible and glorious joy, uh, we don't turn that into a rebuke. You need to be joyful. Rejoice, rejoice. That, that's the, the opposite of what the passage is doing. The passages tend to lift up, to build up, to encourage. And so we need to get in tune with the tone of the passage. Number six, we need to preach dialogically. And what I mean by that is that we need to remember that the epistles are one side of a conversation. And uh, part of the ability of the biblical writers is that they frequently predicted the questions or the objections of the recipients. Uh, so Paul typically will address some of the objection, objections that he thinks the recipients will have uh, 
when they hear what he is saying. Um, and so we need to learn to do that. We need to preach in such a way that we are addressing the specific needs of our people and we learn to predict the questions that they will have. Uh, I'm making this strong statement. How will they react? How will they, what barriers do they have in their life that uh, make it difficult for them to accept this ultimate uh, truth? And uh, you can achieve this even just with rhetorical questions uh, and just uh, le- preach in such a way that the, your listeners are engaged in a conversation. Uh, they're perhaps not actually speaking, although in some contexts it might be appropriate to interact uh, directly with, uh, with your listeners. Uh, but you can do that by predicting the questions that they have and by addressing those uh, questions. And then the final uh, advice for preaching the epistles is to make sure we land the theology. Uh, It is ultimate truth. Uh, The epistles deal with big matters of God's sovereignty, of ultimate truth, but yet we need to make sure that we're landing them into the specific context of our people. What What difference does it make for them now that they have grasped this ultimate uh, truth. So these are just some uh, thoughts about preaching the epistles and especially trying to preach the epistles in a genre sensitive uh, way.